But the case of a man in Nevada who became infected twice early this year, not the first example, throws even that thought into doubt. How seriously should we take these individual accounts? Seriously enough, says Sarah Pitt, a fellow of the Institute of Biomedical Science at Brighton University. So this was a relatively young man who had laboratory documented evidence of COVID-19 infection earlier on in the pandemic in the spring, who um, was reinfected um, more recently, so a few months later. And the really interesting thing and the really valuable thing from our point of view as scientists is that because both times he was ill enough to seek medical treatment and go to hospital, have samples taken which were analysed in the laboratory. And so what they found is this is a completely new strain of the COVID-19 virus that this person was infected with the second time, which means it was definitely a reinfection, which means if he did have any immune response in the first place, he's definitely lost it and was able to be infected by the COVID-19 a second time. The fact that he cleared the virus the first time had to mean that he had an immune response to it. No, not necessarily. In the case of coronaviruses in general, not just this one, we don't always detect an antibody response in people. So that might be because we couldn't find it, or it might be that they just don't make it. But we suspect that probably 10, 20% of people don't make an immune response at all. And a significant proportion of people lose whatever response they made within a few months. And this is common to coronaviruses, but it's a bit different to other sorts of viruses. We know, for example, with measles, if you're infected with measles, the majority of people will make an antibody. That will be a marker of the fact their body has responded to the virus and that will give them a lifelong protection. This is one case in America. I think there are a handful of cases around the world that have now been documented with reinfection. And one response is to throw up our hands in horror and say it's hopeless. But that also is not the correct response. Is that right? What these documented reinfections are telling us is that it's happening. I don't think it's a good idea to think, well, it was only been a few cases, so therefore it doesn't happen very often. A lot of people who are infected in March and April, particularly if they had a mild infection, probably didn't have a test. We can't prove reinfection in every single case, but I think it's probably a lot more common than we think. At the public health level, rather than the purely scientific level, uh, I'm interested in lessons. We've, we've had President Trump coming out this week saying, I've had the virus, I'm now immune with the implication that all of us who survive this virus, eventually it will have no one else to feed on. And I guess that's what sort of talked us about as herd immunity. But again, it looks like the science isn't very supportive of that. The science isn't supportive of that. And I don't know what on, on what grounds President Trump is making that claim. Even if he's had an antibody test, and it's a little bit too early for him to have made the long-lasting protective version of the antibody anyway because um, antibodies are produced in in sort of in waves, really. So the, the first one that comes up, it takes about a week to come up and then it lasts for several months, actually, usually. And then the longer-lasting one, that takes more than a week to actually become to a level that we can detect in a laboratory test. So I don't think there's any real grounds for saying that you'd know that you're immune less than a fortnight after your first developing symptoms anyway. But also, there's no reason to assume that even if you can find that antibody, it will last. So we don't know if it will be protective anyway, and we don't know how long it will last. Um, herd immunity is not something which is going to happen with this particular virus. It's not something that's ever happened with any virus without a vaccine anyway, but it's definitely not going to happen with this one. Uh, herd immunity, because it's got this word immunity in it, it sounds like perfect protection, probably uh, misrepresents it. The, the, even if everyone around you has got the immunity, that doesn't mean that it, the virus will never find you. And I don't know whether the other phrase I've heard used is... Um, is endemic equilibrium, the fact that 
this captures the idea that no, the virus will go on circulating. It just won't be at the same kind of exponential growth phases. So herd immunity is where a sufficient proportion of the population overall has protection so that if they get infected with the virus, they won't get sick, the virus won't be able to grow inside them and they won't be able to pass it on to anyone else. That has only ever happened in the whole of human history through vaccination. So that's not really going to happen. Now, endemicity is a more interesting idea because what that says is that the virus... So this is a brand new virus which just popped out of bats. It's then popped into humans. The humans are going, oh my goodness, this is a brand new virus. I haven't seen this. What do I do? And your immune system's frantically trying to make some kind of response. In the meantime, the virus is going, I'm not adapted to live in humans. What's going on? And it's not actually in the virus's long-term interest to kill off millions of people. What it wants to do is kind of settle down and become sort of in equilibrium with the human population. But it's probably going to take more than a few years for that to happen. The viruses which are endemic, if you like, in the human population are things like measles and even influenza. They've been around for centuries. And so we're tracking any little changes to the virus. I mentioned earlier about different strains, but it's not really settling down. So it's too early to say whether it will settle down altogether and One of the reasons why I'm sounding a bit sceptical about that is because that didn't happen with SARS-1. It went away. And one of the reasons it went away is because we didn't wait for it to settle down. We actually tried to get rid of it, which ultimately did work within about 18 months. So that's also a possibility for this virus as well, I think. Your point being that we can't let natural immunity deal with this because we can't rely on it Uh, we don't know yet whether a vaccine is going to do the job or not we've talked about that on this program um, before we don't necessarily have the the drug so in a sense what you're saying is that all these interventions of trying to reduce the contact reduce the spread are are still our main weapon Uh, yes i think they are and the other example which is useful to think about here is its cousin MERS, the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, which popped up for the first time in 2012, so eight years down the line. That hasn't really settled down. We have outbreaks of it every year, albeit they're mostly in the Middle East, That's particularly in Saudi Arabia. And the way it's under control there is through the infection control type measures. So isolating cases, laboratory testing, quarantining and using personal protective equipment and social distancing and the things that we're getting used to to deal with COVID-19 they're having to do that's how MERS is under control in places where MERS is found they have to live with quite large outbreaks sometimes there's nearly 200 people died from it last year and every year there's a there's an outbreak and that's what we are probably going to see with COVID-19 for some time to come I think and we have to be realistic about that that doesn't mean to say we're going to have a pandemic on the scale that we've got at the moment but if we can bring it under control to some extent and have laboratory testing really spot on so that when somebody does get COVID-19 we can find them and we can trace all their contacts and we can quarantine those and then stop it turning into anything bigger. So some countries so far around the world have actually been quite good at doing that already. In Europe, we're not quite so good at it. All across Europe this week, the reported cases are going up and up. But it's a question of keeping those controls on until something better happens. Yes, let's hope we do have a vaccine, but it may be that either it doesn't work at all or doesn't work as well as we think. And it might be we might use it a bit like the influenza vaccine, where we're not trying to stop people from getting influenza. We're trying to get them, stopping them from getting the worst excesses of the influenza infection. What we want to do is try and get this this virus in a situation where it's under control. So we just have small isolated outbreaks you know, it might might settle down and be kind of endemic and we might have it forever. But, you know, we might have outbreaks in the way that we have norovirus outbreaks in hospitals every now and again, or meningitis outbreaks in schools every now and again. It's important and newsworthy and scary at the time, but it's just kind of very well contained. That's what we really should be aiming for with this one. Sarah Pitt, who lectures in microbiology and health at the University of Brighton.